so very much. Thank all of you for sticking around for the, the last talk. Uh, I'm the thing standing between you and a glass of wine, so thank you for sticking around. And uh, that, that very generous invita uh, introduction from Peter, I think, nicely conceals something about me that I want to unconceal and reveal, which is that my professional history is very, very weird. Right. If you look here, I've been a Shakespearean. I started my career as a historian of things happening four centuries ago. These days, I split my time. Mostly, I'm a futurist. I work for the USC Annenberg Center for the Digital Future. I have my own company as well. So I'm split between the past and the future. And the future, as we've heard in some of the talks, particularly Jill Walker, Rettberg's talk, the future is changing things all the time. So I'm getting to the Shakespeare, but before I get to the Shakespeare, I want to talk for a moment about digital. Because digital technologies are changing everything about our lives. We have digital transformation and analog erosion. Digital creates new behaviors and it also changes existing behaviors. And frequently, the thing that gets changed by digital are things that we used to take for granted when we had analog structures. So if you think about it, we used to be able to watch television when things were on. And nowadays, we watch television whenever we want, wherever we want, on many different devices. So I could talk for hours about this concept. But what I really want to do is just use one image to really highlight this moment. <laughs> it's a beautiful picture, and the story tells itself. There's a young couple, possibly the first time that they've had their arms wrapped around a member of the desired sex. They're sharing an intimate and beautiful moment. And they're also sharing that moment with all of their friends because of the phones that they have in their hands. We have a classic interaction between two people that is being amplified and changed by technology. So what does this have to do with a talk about Shakespeare, and particularly a talk about Shakespeare in Bergen in Norway, a playwright, British playwright has been dead for 400 years, and we're talking about it here in third millennial Bergen. Well, the reason is simple. We also happen to be at a business school. We're here at NHH. We're here at a school that's focused on business. Shakespeare's been a very successful business entity for 400 years. Shakespeare has absorbed all of the vicissitudes that life and change could possibly have thrown at him. And I think it's worthwhile thinking about Shakespeare as a business genius. And there's a lot of Shakespeare here in Bergen. You had a taming of the shrew over the summer. You have Romeo and Juliet coming starting in December at the Philharmonic. You've got Bill Pullman, the American movie star, coming to do Othello here. He'll speak in English. Everyone else will speak in Norwegian. That's going to be weird. <laughs> and then you have my favorite piece of Shakespeare in Bergen trivia, which is this place by the uh, bus station, which is the Romeo and Juliet hair salon. So you, too, can get your hair cut and then die young and tragically for love. <laughs> What I want to know, though, the important question is, how do we have both of these things? How do we have this and also this? Right? How does one body of work inspire the Philharmonic and the hair salon? It's an exciting question. It's not a question, I believe, that we get from this guy. This is a picture of the bust of Shakespeare that is parked near his grave. This is information we get about Shakespeare after his business was concluded. I think we're much more likely to get answers from this guy. This is the more recently unearthed Sanders portrait. It's a picture of Shakespeare when he was a younger man, when he was vibrant and engaged in his business day to day. Let's talk about his business. Because usually we presume that Shakespeare was a, a financial success, he was a business success. We believe, oh, this is not really working with the slides. I'm so sorry. We believe that Shakespeare's business success was the result of his artistic genius. Plays were pretty good, made a lot of money. But maybe it's the other way around. Maybe instead Shakespeare's artistic genius was powered by his business genius. So I want to talk about Shakespeare's jobs, because he actually had four of them. We only usually talk about the one that we have the traces for. He was a playwright. The plays were pretty good. But he was also an actor in the company that he worked with day in and day out, putting on sometimes five different plays in one week. He was a part owner in the company that put on the plays, and he was a part owner in the buildings in which they put on the shows. 
So he had a much more remarkable and interesting perspective on his business than most playwrights. In fact, he had an entirely unique perspective on his business. He had four jobs, four perspectives, and four customer experiences. But he was only in one business, and that's important. This gentleman, Theodore Levitt, in 1960, very famously asked in the Harvard Business Review, what business are you in? If you're in, uh, if you're a business involves putting a lot of trains on tracks and sending them somewhere, and you're asked that question, and you answer, I'm in the train business, you're giving a much different perspective than if you answer, I'm in the transportation business. If you say you're in the train business, then you're defending your existing structure. If you're in the transportation business, you're helping people and companies get stuff that they need to go from one place to another. So what business was Shakespeare in? He wasn't in the playwriting business. He wasn't in the acting business. He wasn't in the theater management business. He wasn't in the company business. Shakespeare was in show business, right? And answering the question about show business is a different order of magnitude question and leads to more interesting questions. We've been trying to figure out why Shakespeare was great from looking inside of the plays for 400 years, and we haven't figured it out yet. What I'm arguing today is if we look at the structure and the economic relationship that he had to his work, then suddenly we start to draw, uh, withdraw lessons that we can apply to other businesses, to our own businesses today. And so the acting, we can consider the story. We can talk about the performance, right? This, actually, I, I, allow me to correct myself. The characters are the story, the actors, the performance. We move on to connections out there, connections from what's happening in the theater to the rest of the culture. And finally, and most powerfully in Shakespeare's case, because he was the only one who could do it, we have memories right here. This one is defensible. And if you're here in a business school, having a defensible differentiator is key to your business success. So what do I mean by all of these things? Well, this is the Shakespeare strategy. I'm going to zoom in now on four moments from Shakespeare, four moments to illustrate what I'm talking about. The first is the story. And let's go back to Romeo and Juliet. And specifically, it's a little hard to see, but this is the balcony scene, the most beautiful love scene in all of English theater. These two young people are crazy hot for each other. They just met. Romeo has been stalking Juliet. He's been spying on her. She doesn't mind because he's really cute. <laughs> and they want nothing more than to bathe in the newfound love that they have for each other. They want to be totally immersed in the rhetoric of their love. And yet, that's really hard. And Juliet herself points this out. And she says, uh, and I can read it in Elizabethan English, but let me just paraphrase. Why are you here? What are you doing? Are you crazy? You climbed over the walls. They're pretty high walls. And by the way, if my family catches you, they're going to kill you. <laughs> so even in the moment that Juliet wants nothing more than to be immersed in the story of her love for Romeo, she can't be. She can't stay immersed in that. But she's still immersed in the moment. It's a different kind of immersion. Usually when we think about immersion, we think about this. This is a very technologically driven immersion. You are all sitting in an audience where the lights are dimmed, where you're focused on me, right? You are in control of the situation because the environment is helping you to control your perceptions. That's not what was going on in Shakespeare's theater. This is a facsimile of the globe in London today, which is very accurate, and look at how busy it is, right? You're standing, people are jostling, you don't know where to look. You're still immersed. But your immersion in the story, in the story of what's happening on stage, is fragile. And because it's fragile, it's also very precious. So from the balcony scene, I want to go to the performance, and to another play, which is Shakespeare's later play, The Winter's Tale, and specifically to a moment in Act Three of The Winter's Tale, where Antigonus, who's a lord, is abandoning a baby on the beach in Bohemia, by, by the way, Bohemia doesn't have a beach, but okay, that was a long time ago. So he's abandoning a baby, and for this crime, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes the most famous and weirdest stage direction in all of Shakespeare, and possibly in all of theater. Exit pursued by a bear. Exit pursued by a bear. What? What is that? There's no production in 400 years of this play that does not have a problem with that stage direction. But in Shakespeare's England, it was a big problem. First of all, bear in Shakespeare's England did not mean this. 
okay? Shakespeare's England did not mean fuzzy bears. They didn't mean profane bears like Ted. What Shakespeare's, what bear meant in Shakespeare was this guy, <laughs> way scary, okay? And bears were not uncommon. Shakespeare's England had bear baiting as an entertainment. That's when a bear gets chained up and dogs attack the bear until the bear kills the dogs or the dog kills the bear. This was their version of reality television. And bears and bear baiting were not something that was far distant from Shakespeare's England. Quite to the contrary, this is the neighborhood in Southwark where Shakespeare's theater was. There's the globe, right there. Across the street is the bear baiting house, right next to each other. So when you see this, this sign, when this happened in the theater, you have to understand, no one in the theater at that moment was paying attention to the story. They were having one of two responses. Either, oh, there's a nice man in a bear suit. Huh, interesting. Or, yeah, it's a bear! Right? They were ejected from the performance, from the story at that moment, and put into the performance. They were focused on the conditions of theater. They were not focused on the story itself. Now, why is that important? Because I think today, if we're watching a movie and we're distracted from the movie by the environment around us, well, we think of that as a loss. But in Shakespeare's England, in the original conditions of the story, what we're seeing is something quite different, which is that those two things add together to a greater whole. Right? Two different aspects of the business add together to a greater whole. It's much more like watching a football game today than, it was, than watching a movie. If you want an analog of what it's like to go to the theater 400 years ago, it's like going to a soccer game, where you're not only watching the game itself, you're also paying attention to the other people around you in the stands because you represent your row, right? You're not only looking at the game that's happening right now, but you're also remembering the other games that happened before, and you're thinking about how victory or defeat will lead your team off into a different direction. You are having a much more integrated experience with this particular uh, football game than you are when you watch a movie. And that is, hmm, and this is now dead. Let's try this again. There we go. So now, part three, connections out there. Libraries have been written about connections between Shakespeare's theater and the culture. So I'm gonna zoom in very briefly on just one. Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, in 1601, in February, decided to overthrow the queen. He uh, didn't, uh, had, a, had a lot of silly ideas about this, but one of the silly ideas was he hired Shakespeare's company. And he paid them, at the time, a lot of money, 40 shillings, to put, to, put together a, a, a new version of an old play that they hadn't performed very much recently, the tragedy of Richard II, which features a legal king getting overthrown. Eleven of the conspirators and a bunch of other people in the audience watched the play. Why did this happen? Why did they put it on? Two reasons. One, it was self-propaganda. They were trying to rev themselves up to overthrow the, the queen the following day. And secondly, they were hoping that a lot of other people would see the play and go, this is a great idea. Let's overthrow Queen Elizabeth and join up. Neither of them worked. The rebellion failed utterly. Uh, Robert uh, uh, Devereux, Earl of Essex, was beheaded for his uh, crime. I presume that Shakespeare's company, at the very least, got a stern talking to. And no one missed the point. No one failed to make the connection between this performance of Richard II and the attempted overthrow of the Queen. Her, queen Elizabeth herself famously said, I am Richard II. Know ye not that. This was called application in Elizabethan England. And the stakes were very, very high. The stakes would be as high as life itself. Finally, memories right here. Memories that connect the performance that you're watching to an earlier performance that you saw before in the same theater, put on by the same actors, and sometimes by the same playwright. So let me zoom in on a moment from Hamlet. And in fact, it's this moment this is a moment where Polonius and Hamlet are talking about Polonius's history as an amateur actor in college. And here is what it says. Hamlet says, now, my lord, you played once in the university, you say. And Polonius says, that I did, my lord, and was accounted a good actor. And Hamlet says, and what did you enact? And Polonius says, I did enact Julius Caesar. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. So this is two guys who are actually being played by actors talking about a theatrical performance that happened in a fictional past. That's weird. Gets weirder, 
because this is not only a reference to a scene in a fictional performance in Denmark, it's also a reference to an earlier tragedy by Shakespeare, the tragedy of Julius Caesar, where Caesar was killed by Brutus in the capital. And it gets even weirder because Hamlet was put on in 1600. Julius Caesar was put on just one season before and was in repertory constantly as of 1599. But wait, there's still more weirdness to come because Richard Burbage, who was playing Hamlet, had played Brutus, and John Hemmings, we're pretty sure, who was playing Polonius, had played Caesar. So when, watch carefully, when Hamlet is talking to Polonius about how Polonius played Caesar, and Brutus killed Caesar, so the arrows aren't working, but you get the picture. It's also John Hemmings playing Polonius, who had played Caesar, talking to Richard Burbage playing Hamlet, who had played Brutus. I don't know about you, but I have a headache now. <laughs> it's crazy how complicated that set of interactions is, but also crazy how effortlessly some of the people in the audience would have understood it. Right? Now, watching Hamlet in 1600, I'm not suggesting that everybody in the audience would have understood that. Right? Not everyone would have. So the question is, who would have understood it? Who did? Was it the rich people, the aristocrats? Was it the poor people, the peasants paying a penny and standing there? No, not at all. In fact, we're asking the wrong question. And this is a wrong question that lots and lots of businesses ask, and that's why I'm talking about it right now. They're more like these people, the fans, the fans of Shakespeare's company, who are the ones who are understanding how this works. It's a different notion of identity. Ordinarily in business, you have a target market. You're going for moms. You're looking at guys 15 to 19. You're looking at women 34 to 45. You're looking, in other words, to tie your product to an identity that your customer has before they meet your product. And that can work. And it's good to know who's likely to buy your product. That's not what Shakespeare's doing with this fourth kind of connection. Right? What Shakespeare's doing with this fourth kind of connection is he is creating an identity that dynamically emerges from your interaction with his product. Right? You're, you're, when you're in Shakespeare's company, when you're in the Globe Theater, you're not there as a lord, you're not there as a poor person, you're there as a fan. The primary separation in Shakespeare's mind in his audience were the people who had been there many times before and the people who were there for the first time. For the people who'd been there many times before, he created an entirely new level of experience, and a very exciting one. Now, that takes us back to the subtitle of the talk today as I wrap up, which is the Shakespeare strategy, how to use it in your business today. We have here what he was doing with the story, the performance, connections out there, and memories right here. But we can also shift that. Right? You have to focus on your product, and your product has to be good. Right? That's table stakes. But you also need to think about the experience of your product, not just the qualities of the product itself. You want the experience to be as powerful as the product itself. Your product needs to be embedded in the cultural moment that your uh, company is in. Right? You need to be part of the conversation. You need to be part of the culture. And finally, you want to work very hard to create an identity that your customer has only when they are using your product, because if you do that, they're not going to leave you for your competitor. This is the Shakespeare strategy. And now the question is, is this just vertical integration? Vertical integration, which is a supply chain issue. Vertical integration, which is you own everything, soup to nuts. Apple does a fantastic job of this with their iPhone. Right? They own everything about it. But this is not the Shakespeare strategy. Vertical integration is powerful, but the Shakespeare strategy is a 360 degree integration of experience. So the last question is, are there any businesses that are doing this today? And I argue that it's easy to, for me to come up with four of them. We have Nike, Disney, Apple, and Red Bull. We have a consumer electronics company, a media company, an athletic wear company, and an energy drink company. Apple which has a just total solution. They've got the phones, the tablets, they've got the computers, they have iTunes, they just bought Beats by Dr. Dre, right? They're, and they're, they have the retail stores, which are the thing that really hook it all together. With Disney, they've got the theme parks, they've got the television, they've got the movies, they have the princess merchandise, which is an ideology for little girls, it's amazing. 
Nike has not only the footwear and the athletic wear and the golf clubs, but an entire data enterprise going into it. They're focused on their customer, on being a better running partner to their customer. And finally, Red Bull, an energy drink that also owns television stations and is throwing guys out of satellites and watching them parachute <laughs> down to the, to the, to the ground. Right? Each of these companies are very different. Each of these companies are deeply integrated into the lives and experiences of their customers. And they're from four very different industries. And before this talk began, I'm, I suspect that if someone had asked you to come up with one word to describe all four of these companies, that you would have been challenged to do so. But hopefully now you understand that there is one word that describes all four of these companies. And that word is Shakespeare. <laughs> so if you like that, you can learn more about me at bradbarons.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Brad Behrens. Thank you for coming to TEDxBird.